right, well, hello. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to another GWIX event. Uh, today, uh, I am very, very happy to introduce you to two of our distinguished speakers. Uh, but we will talk about uh, Korean cinema, uh, the global business and film policies. And I will be your host and moderator, Emmanuel Kim. I am the Korea Foundation Kim Renaud Associate Professor of Korean Literature and Culture Studies here at uh, the George Washington University. Uh, the two speakers that I will be introducing uh, just recently published a book called The Untold Story of the uh, Korean Film Industry, A Global Business and Economic Perspective, published this year, 2021, uh, by Paul Grave McMillan. Our first speaker is Professor Patrick Messalang, who is a professor emeritus of economics at Sciences Po Paris and chairman steering committee of the European Center for International Political Economy in Brussels. His current research deals with economic and trade relations between Europe and East Asia with a particular focus on cultural industries. Our second speaker, Chimin Park, is a visiting lecturer at Sciences Po, France, and research associate at the Institute of Communication Research in Seoul National University. His research projects are related to the uh, competitiveness of organizations, industries, and countries. His current research focuses on cultural industries that are faced with a changing business and trade environment, as well as new challenges from digitization. So without further ado, I will hand it over to uh, Professor Messalang. You will have 20 to 30 minutes and then you can hand it over to uh, Jimin. And for the audience, please, uh, we welcome any questions from you, but do not uh, put it in the chat box, please. There is a separate Q&A box. So please submit your questions there, Professor Messalang. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kim. Thank you for the invitation of uh, the George Washington Institute for Korean Studies. We are very uh, happy and uh, grateful for this uh, uh, event. Let me first try to do the most difficult thing for me, which is to share my PowerPoint. Okay, thank you very much again. And uh, for this opportunity to present this research, it has been a long road. And what we have in mind is uh, not only the film policy, but in some sense, the idea that economics and culture are not antagonistic. Very often people believe that uh, economics and business approach are against culture and economists and business people think that uh, a cultural approach is unworkable. So you have two camps. One say the state is the only legitimate protector of the culture and the other camp say the firms the firms are the only ones that should be in charge and in fact both are lying in some sense uh, i will talk about france this is my country so i'm freer to talk about my own country than about other countries but in france the state has been manipulated and captured by the vested interest of the cultural policy so it's really hard to see to which extent we can consider it as a legitimate protector of the French culture. Uh, the uh, only other, the only example, if I can say, is that recently this government, I, I am nothing against this government, it's just one of the many French government to do the same thing. They give a subsidy to all young people of 300 euros to buy books. And of course, all the French kids have bought manga. So I cannot see this is really the protector of the French uh, culture. On the other hand, the people who say that the firms are the only one that should be charged. Here I have to talk about uh, the uh, US majors. Um, the, we will see that the US major film company are grabbing all the subsidies that they can all over the world. And it's normal if you are a company, if you have subsidies, if you can grab them, you, you do it. So, but so far it was just two camps. 
And in fact, Korea is really interesting because it's the first illustration with evidence, with facts, showing a good balance from an economic point of view in the long run, 40 years, between the respective roles of the government and companies in the film industry. And this nice approach, Korean approach, is really a, country, a critical contribution to the Korean success in the uh, industries, cultural industries. So it's, you have really a combination of economics and culture which go pretty well. And as a result, we believe that Korea looks like a game changer for developing countries which have no industries, film industry, and which would like to develop it. Well, they have to look at the Korean example. It was Korea 50 years ago. And for countries which have a very heavy film policy, maybe they should look at the Korean case for making its more efficient uh, film policy. Well, key points, I, mean, I, I, I really doubt that many people uh, have no idea about Korean uh, success, but it is just success here and there, you know, music, uh, uh, drama, film, but most of the non-Korean people have very little idea about the capacity of the Korean film industry and the same for the music industry and drama industry to be a real powerhouse. They don't have the good idea of the relationship between the uh, Korea and the rest of the world. And they think that Korea is a small market, but in fact, Korea, the Korean film market is one of the top three to three to or four, depending the year's largest market in the world uh, during the last three, three years. And again, this global results has been achieved by a balance. On one hand, a film policy, which is consistent over time, that's critical, with very little uh, buyers to entry coming from import for no import quota. It has been eliminated in 86. Screen quota, Jimin Park will talk about it in details. It's more complicated. Uh, very prudent use of subsidies, contrary to France, for example, and few excessively restrictive domestic regulation. There are regulation, a market needs, uh, needs regulation, but it does need restrictive regulation and Korea is relatively using uh, regulations which are mo moderately uh, restrictive. And there is also the recognition of the companies as the lead leading actors. And of course, the success of Parasite has put that in the, on the forefront. It's a subsidiary of a table and it has, they have built a long-term uh, strategy in terms of production, it's often said, but also in terms of distribution production, these Korean companies have essentially looked at the US cases and they have made the lessons from the US cases. But in terms of distribution, very few people understand that in fact, the Korean distribution system is more advanced than the US distribution system because the US has a kind of restrictive regulation, uh, anti-monopoly regulation, which well, was disappearing only last year. Um, the, uh, Korea has opened the market uh, reluctantly. It has been forced by the treaty with the US. Um, Mexico has opened the market. France has opened the market approximately at the same time, late 80s. But contrary to Korea, which is a success, Mexico and France, in terms of cultural aspect, are failures. So we should understand why. First, an overview about the growth on the left side, a panel, which gives you the overall box office revenue in each of these six selected countries. So for example, the blue line, this is the total box office revenues in US dollars constant 2018. Everything is US dollar constant 18, uh, 2018. And you can see that in fact, the Korean blue line is uh, more market than the uh, more, the growth is more market than for the others, especially for the European. Of course, you have this red line, but this red line, this is China, and this is China with 1, mil, 1 billion, 200 million of uh, watchers, of movie viewers. So this um, left uh, panel is a little bit uh, biased because of the difference in the population. 
But nevertheless, whether even with this difference of population, you can see that Korea, which started very low in the beginning, in, uh, 40 years ago, is now at the level of France or UK, catching up. On the right, uh, the right panel, we try to adjust for the size of the population. So these uh, lines, this curve, represent the growth of the box office revenue per capita each of these. And surprised <laughs> ourselves by this, see that the uh, box office revenue per capita in Korea basically is the so in say that after 40 years ago, basically, uh, out of um, this country. Here you have two arrows. These arrows here, bottom uh, left, represent the, the date of the liberalization of the Korean market. This arrow here on the top, on the right, represent a um, negotiation between Korea and the US in which in fact the era was a very, at the very beginning of the negotiation, a big clash between the US and Korea because the US insists that Korea will open more its film market. So the film industry looks nice industry, but in fact it has always been a very strong uh, uh, contention uh, object uh, between countries and between the US and, um, and Korea. And you can understand why when the US was so much insisting of liberalizing more the Korean market, here the box office revenue per capita was going down. So the domestic market of the US major was in fact shrinking. So they wanted really to have access to our market in order to create uh, their business. Uh, that's the and we want to go one step further by looking at all, not only all the film in one country, but by dividing the, gross, the box office revenue in one country into box office revenue of domestic film, a red line here, this is the left side is the Korea case. So this is the Korean films, domestic, the red line. And the green line, this is the box office revenues per capita. Per capita of the US film in Korea. And you can see that between the uh, beginning of the liberalization here, then the two curves here are basically very different, very bad situation from the Korean film, better situation for the US film. But after 2000, something really changed completely. The track of the Korean film, uh, the growth of the Korean film industry really started to boom. And uh, the uh, US film had a growth also, but a growth which is less important. In other words, this market, two growth, uh, two curves are growing. This is a film country, except in the US, because the US has markets. But in countries like Korea, etc., the world market is much more smaller. Basically, the company goes down. In. And here I mentioned Nikki Lee. We mentioned Nikki Lee because Nikki Lee, when she received the, the price, if, if I could say that, for Parasite, very uh, emotional uh, speech in favor of the Korean consumers telling him that she, really the Korean film industry has been very much supported by the, the Korean uh, moviegoers, including by the criticism that the Korean moviegoers have addressed to the Korean film industry. And this is because they have been exposed to more freely, more frequently, more actively than in other countries. And in I should add that the Korean notion of cultural diversity is a very specific, very special cultural diversity in Korea, mostly, not always, of course, mostly say uh, this is the capacity of moviegoers to uh, be exposed to many films. Well, look at the panel. This is my game. So what you can see is just flat. 
Tanguyat, the red line, which is the French film in France, is always below the green line, green line which is the US film uh, uh, watched in France, exhibited in France. And this is, we will explain, because the liberalization which occurred in the early 90s has been totally inconsistent. The topic is on Korea, so I don't want to go into detail about France, but the prime that, the, as I said at the beginning, the state policy has been inconsistent. They open, they close, they open, they close. So uh, basically at the end, they close. And including uh, the hyper-regulation of the movie theater market, which is quite different from what is going on in Korea. You could tell oh, this is Korea, this is France, there are many other countries. You can see with these two diagrams uh, that really Korea is really special, both on domestic film and in terms of US film compared to the other countries. Now, you may be uh, astonished that I did not talk about the number of film produced. And very frequently, when we discuss about the film industry, people talk about the number of films. And the French are very often saying, oh, we produce a lot of films. So we are a very lively industry. Now, unfortunately, it's not as easy as that. In fact, you can produce a lot of film, but the film can be of bad quality. And it's or not good quality. This is what happened in France. You can produce less film, but they are good quality. Look at the diagram on the uh, right. On the top, you have the top diagram, you have the number of the films. And you can see that for the um, Korean blue line, always blue line, it's just a continuous decline with a blip uh, at the end of the 1980s the country is declining in the number of film produced. And this is only 10 years later after the liberalization that the decline of the number of the liberalization increased. The and the reason for this diversion, you have a lot of subsidies in Korea. You have no industrial adjustment in France due to a lot of the subsidies. You have a lot of industrial adjustment in how the thing is modern by uh, learning from the US. You can have the average the average box office revenue per film. So this is, this is how they show the, you go to the movie theater, you're ready to spend your dollars or your euro. This is the attractiveness of the film. And you can see the difference in what happened in France and Korea. In Korea, the attractiveness of the film were always very low until the first because in fact, the Korean filmmaker beginning to adjust to the modern film did not have really yet. That happened in the second half of the 90s. And then immediately you have this, immediately. Very quickly, you have this huge increase in average box revenue per film, meaning that in fact, the Korean film industry has been able to produce blockbusters in a relatively big quantity. On the, on the other side, look at the French, it's exactly the contrary. It's steadily decline of the average box office in per film. Well, the next slide is not very important. It's just the previous slides stop at 2005 and they just, we just show the, uh, the, the trajectories were going in the same direction until 2015. After 2015, there is a small problem of statistics, so we stopped there, but uh, uh, it's still true. That's one point, uh, but uh, what about the, uh, another aspect, which is the subsidies? And then you can see with the diagram, the panel, and the red and black lines, which are the French and the British. In France and UK, in, in France and in UK, you have a continuous of subsidies, not small, right? 400, 400 million of dollars, and then up to 600 and 800 million of dollars, it's not small amount. On Korea, you have 
some increase, but very below the level of the French and the British, and then a decrease. So what you observe is that the uh, subsidies system has been much better managed in Korea than in fact in the uh, other countries. There are good, there are serious reasons about that. There are also some good, happy situation uh, until in Korea, until the mid 2000s, there were very few funds available in Korea for the film industry. That was really a waste of time and a waste of money for a government, which, is, which was obsessed by uh, success in manufacturing. Uh, at the same time, in, after the mid 2000s, the government, Korean government became interested in the film industry more and more. But at the, at this, at, during the same period, the tables or the subsidiary of the tables which have been investing in the, the film industry were so successful that they did not need any subsidy and they did not want to have subsidies. As a result, Korea escaped negative side effects of subsidies. Subsidies look always nice, but this is a poison in some sense. If you give a subsidy to one domestic film and company, you heard another domestic film company, we can explain it later during the Q&A session. And you give, if you give many different types of subsidies, one type of, subsidy, one type of subsidies can counter, go against the effect of the other, can annihilate the effects of the other. So this is the consistency of these schemes. And Korea, because it has low level of subsidies, has been able to avoid these two main traps of the subsidy policy. A very quick institution and regulation. Of course, the market needs to be regulated. The film, we always talk about the film policy of the government, but the government does not really do direct about agency. In Korea, this, is, this agency is called COFIC, and in France, it's called CNC. The basic question, do you want a large, very well-funded uh, agency, or do you want a very well-targeted ad, uh, agency? The Koreans have been chosen the second option, very more limited, well-targeted agency. The French have uh, chosen the first uh, The problem is that when you are a large agency, you are very sensitive to vested interest. This is the political economy of the subsidies Vested interests now try to get uh, try, uh, maximize the level of subsidies they can extract from the government. Um, we will go later on all these questions about subsidies, I am sure, because there are many and uh, to, to do that right now. But that's information. Uh, well, the market needs to be regulated, can be severely regulated or lightly regulated. You can see that Korea is among the least regulated um, market, but on the contrary, on the other side, you have France is more, and then you have, of course, China, which is very much regulated. And this is based on the text, so it's not based on the all the other aspects that the China film policy uh, can have in China. Last slide. The ultimate test is the quality of the thing. So far, we have talked about attractivity of the film. Attractivity of the film, this is something which works before you go to the movie theater. You heard that Parasite is a good film, so maybe I should go. Now you can go out of the movie theater absolutely disappointed or absolutely enthusiastic. So attractiveness is before going to the movie theater. Quality is after when you have really watched the film industry because movies are experienced good. You have to see them. And so the box office revenue are not a good, they are an excellent indicator of attractiveness, but they are not a good indicator of the, uh, the ratings. So we have to have very specific uh, indicator. They, had, they are done by a huge by a firm which manipulate huge database uh, on, on the ratings given by all the moviegoers in their respective country, here the really interesting and surprising result, at least less surprising since you have Parasite, but very surprising nevertheless, is that Korea, as a, on average, Korean films have a better ratings 
uh, by the moviegoers than the French, the British, or the US films. So that's, uh, for us, is a good amen for the sustainability of the uh, in, uh, in this cultural industry, nothing is certain. Uh, this is one survival of the current film industry. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick. Um, unfortunately, I, I believe there was some connection problem. And as a result, uh, the majority of your lecture was very choppy, unfortunately. Oh, um, yeah, oh. I, I'm, I'm really sorry. However, your slide was very descriptive. So I believe our audience was able to uh, get the gist of what your lecture was about uh, based on your slides. So unfortunately, um, yeah. I'm it, sorry. The sound sorry. quality was not so good. Hopefully our next speaker, Jimin, will have a better uh, connection and uh, yes, I will turn it over to you now, Jimin. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, I want to talk about the um, the Korean the business side of the Korean film industry. So the interesting thing is that actually you need to understand you know uh, why Korea is important and what is the problem um, for the re existing research. For example, like a lot of people, if you go over internet or some news cycles, you know, when they when they talk about the emergence of Korean film industry, they said um, this is because of the protectionist, you know, measures that Korean government employed before, such as the screen quota. So we try to examine if this is really meaningful uh, in order to, you know, make the Korean film industry more competitive. Another issue is like people, they don't talk about, you know, what happened before. They only focus on what happened after, you know, uh, the late in 1999 till, you know, today, because, uh, you know, this is why uh, when, you know, Korean films are really, you know, um, gain a lot of popular popularity across the world. Another point, another issue, um, actually, when people talk about Korean film industry, actually, they don't have any data sets. They don't understand what is going on behind, and they just talk about, you know, very superficially. Um, so, you know, in the presentation that I want to, you know, talk about, you know, I will highlight the important factors, which is you know, business and cooperation side. Um, Korean film industry is very interesting because, you know, uh, in the film industry, across the world, usually there are three major uh, major measures to protect or to promote film industries. The first one is import quota, which means basically the government, they regulate the number of films imported to one country. The second one is the screen quota. And then also, you know, in other countries, it can be like a dubbing quota or something like that. Uh, so this is basically the, uh, controlling the number of exhibition at movie theater. The last one is subsidies, which you know Petro already talked about it, and the French government is really famous for the you know, subsidy measures. So anyway, the interesting thing is like you know the Korean government actually employed all of three measures, and then the different thing is like you know, there's a specific period that work really really you know um, distinctively. So this is makes the Korean film industry really interesting. Um, as you see in the um, in the graph, for example, like a uh, till 1987, you know, Korea, gov Korean government employed the import quota. And then after that, uh, Korean government, you know, exercised the screen quota from 19 1987 to 2006. And then, you know, more recently, Korean government focused on subsidies. Okay, let me talk about the import quota first. Um, the first thing you have to understand, you know, the issue in Korean film industry is always the US films, okay? Just like other countries. Because a lot of people, you know, they love to go to movie theater in order uh, to watch, you know, American films, Hollywood films, because they are really, really well done. But another interesting aspect you have to remember that is that in 19, uh, after Korean War, so in the late 19, 1950s and 1960s, actually Korea enjoyed its golden age which is very different from you know, what we believed, okay? So anyway, at the time in Korea, at least, okay, the domestic films are really, really, really popular. 
Anyway, the Korean government, they believe that you know, the film industry is very, very important, especially, you know, a lot of people, they argue this is related to culture and then um, national um, identity. So the Korean government, they want to do something with free film industry. So they introduced the import quota in 1958. Okay, um, again, this is more like you know, how the government control the number of foreign films imported in Korea, okay, per year, okay. Um, the interesting thing is like uh, at the beginning, the Korean government, they said, okay, if you produce three very well done Korean films, then I wanna give you one license to import foreign films. So this is more like a you know, quality based. But several years later, they found that there is a huge problem and that they changed from quality-based reward to quantity-based reward, which means basically it's not about quality. They said, if you produce three films, doesn't matter in terms of quality, but then I'm gonna give you one license to import foreign films. Again, at the time, major you know, import films are from Hollywood and then it is really, really, really popular. Okay. Um, again, in at the time Korea enjoyed, you know, it's a golden age. So basically, Korean government believed that this is really, really good to export Korean films in order to gain foreign currency, such as US dollars. Okay. So they said, okay, we don't have money yet. However, we produce really good film, so we can export it. So for that one, I think uh, the Korean government believed that they need to have some kind of measure, which is actual input quota. Okay, so the idea is basically without investing a lot of money in Korean film industry, they said Korean companies, they produce good Korean films and export and make a lot of foreign currency. And then by using that foreign currency gained, they have to reinvest to produce Korean films. Okay, so this is the basic innovation. Um, as I told you before, um, the ratio is three to one. Okay, at the beginning, they said, you know, they have to produce really, really good quality films. However, it is very difficult to define what we mean by you know, good quality films, okay? So the Korean government today said, okay, if the films receive international film festival prize, prize or you know, domestic film festival prize, then we consider that as really, really good films. Okay, of course, at the time, although Korea enjoyed its golden age, but it is really, really difficult to go to, you know, Ghana Film Festival or Berlin Film Festival to gain, you know, prizes. Okay, so what they did is actually the Korean ind film industry, they established a lot of local film, uh, film festivals in Korea, and then they just are sharing the prizes. Okay. Um, so the government figured out this is a huge problem and then they just manipulate, you know, with the money or whatever, and then the, you know, Korean film festivals, so they changed. So it became, you know, just you produce three films, then I'm going to give you one license to import, you know, one foreign films. So this is what, you know, government, you know, uh, began the input quota. Of course, in terms of no film numbers, it is controllable because it is the government who control it. So as you can see here in the you know, graph, you know, this is the ceiling. So in terms of number of films imported, you, know, you can see that it is well respected. However, the interesting thing is like the number of admission. Although the Korean government intended to restrict the number of films, foreign films in order to promote Korean films. However, in the market, you know, the audience, you know, they are paying the money so when they choose uh, films, they, of course, they pick up the, you know, very, very well done films. Uh, here you have to understand one thing, okay? Nowadays in Korea, in the United States, you know, sometimes US films release in Korea, you know, earlier than, you know, they do in United States. But in 1950s, you know, right, you know, after the Korean War, it is not the case. Basically, that means, you know, the U.S. released the film, and then you know it is released in Japan. So the Korean, um, the film industry saw, so, okay, this is really really successful in U.S. This is also successful in Japan, and then why don't we, you know, release the same film in Korea? So there is like a six months or one year gap. Okay, so basically that means when Korean film industry company, I mean the Korean companies import foreign films, it is already really really well done and successful films. So this is the you know, way 
to guarantee you know, they can make a lot of money. Okay. Of course, the interesting thing is like, you know, the number of foreign films imported in Korea, it is really, really, you know, inferior to the number of Korean films released at movie theater. So of course, and then the films from in Hollywood is really well done. So if you compare the number of admission per, per, per film, you know, for foreign, foreign films, you know, you can see there is a you know, high number of you know, admission, okay? So of course they go to movie theater to watch, you know, Hollywood films because they need to spend the same money to watch Korean films and then Hollywood films. So all of them, they just go to movie theater to watch Hollywood films. However, when Korean government, you know, uh, abolished the import quota after the Korea-US film agreements uh, through the uh, from 1950, 1945 to 19, uh, uh, 1985 to 1988, okay? So when they abolished that one, and then the Hollywood companies, they distribute their films directly to Korean film, uh, Korean movie theaters. And then the number of films imported to Korea, of course, it has increased significantly and then you can see that there is a huge drop in terms of number of you know, admission per films, okay? So that is very interesting point and we have to understand one thing. Uh, one of the reason that Hollywood film industry, I mean, or Hollywood studios, they in distribute or imported you know, their films directly into Korea because they believe that whatever they you know, brought from the United States, it can be really, really successful in Korea. So they just brought whatever. However, this changed the, the, uh, the, the audience view toward you know, Hollywood films. Before, as I told you before, you know, Korean film companies, they imported well done Hollywood films. So the general you know, perception of audience is more like you know, Hollywood films equal very good films. However, when there is direct distribution done by Hollywood studios in Korea, then they just brought you know, any films in, uh, from the United States. And then the general audience realized that, okay, now I see that there is a good films, you know, also there are very bad films, regardless, you know, they are from Korea or Hollywood. So it changed everything. Uh, actually the import quota, it changed a lot of things. Okay, as I told you before, you know, when Korean companies import foreign films, it is really, really successful ones, okay? However, they just realized one thing, okay? Now, the Korean companies cannot distribute directly the Hollywood films, but instead of the Korean films, it is more like Hollywood studios. So Korean companies cannot make a lot of money, okay? The only thing they can do at the time, they try to get movie theater and then having a lot of movie chain, uh, cinema chains, like CJV, I mean, of course, at the time they, they are not using the name, but by having cinema chains, they have some kind of you know, bargaining power against the US studios, okay? So this is the beginning of you know, Korean cinema chains. Second, the number of foreign films is controllable. However, the number of admission is for foreign films, it is un uncontrollable, okay? Of course, as I told you before, because there's a lot of different foreign films in Korea, and then you know, the consumers, they believe that, okay, foreign films, especially high films, is not always good. There are good films and bad films. So they recognize there is some kind of you know, variety in terms of quality. Um, before, because of you know, the input quota is a three to one, okay? So domestic films should be you know, produced like a three, then they can have one license to import one foreign films, okay? So that actually, they knew that if they import a lot of Hollywood films, they can make a lot of money. So Korean companies, they, they just, you know, produced a lot of, you know, films, which we call like quota critics. So they just produce and produce in order to obtain one license, I mean, a number of licenses to import foreign films to make money. So they produce, however, the quality of Korean films is not really good at all at the time. Of course, another interesting thing is like in a corporate system, okay? Um, the Korean companies, especially j at the time, they realized one thing very important. They said, all right, if this is a Hollywood films, it's successful. They just believe that way, just like, you know, Hollywood studios. 
So they said, okay, now because I cannot directly distribute, you know, Hollywood films, then why don't I invest a lot of money in Hollywood? So I can make more uh, films in Hollywood and then I can bring back to you know, Korea. And then I already secure my cinema chain so I can show the, uh, the Hollywood films. So they began to invest a lot of money, you know? Um, however, at the time, you know, Korean companies are not really, really big. And then it was kind of, you know, failure because, you know, just importing successful films from the United States, you know, it guaranteed easily the success, you know, of success in Korea. However, if you involved from production, then you cannot, you know, there's no guarantee that you can, this film can be successful, all right? So, you know, several years, they do a lot of investment in Hollywood, then they got failed, and then they said, okay, it cost too much money, then why don't I bring back that money back to Korea? And in Korea, we just produce Korean films, and then we invest a lot of money to produce Korean films. So at the time, you know, there is a lot of verticalization between companies in order to you know produce good films uh, i just skipped the you know the quota quota critics you know now you know the korean companies cannot import highly the films and then the only way to make money in korea you know it is just produce real quality korean films so they focus on producing really really good korean films you know, after abolition of input quota now let me talk about the screen quota, which is also very interesting. Um, originally, this one is introduced in 1966. However, however, there is input quota, so it was just nominal. So the, it was not really you know, exercised, okay? Um, it is basically guaranteeing the number of days for screening Korean films, because in the market, you know, people, they love to watch you know, Hollywood films, and then the government believed that this is not good. So they said, okay, at least we should, you know, assure a certain number of screen to show Korean films. So this is the screen quota. Okay. Of course, this is another protection. Um, actually, people they got confused sometimes. They said, you know, screen quota, this is for diversity. But in fact, if you go over the law, a uh, screen quota is not for the uh, diversifi diversification of genre. Okay, this is simply to guarantee the number of days for Korean films at movie theater, okay? Um, this is the yellow line. This is the screen quota based ratio of Korean films. So the interesting thing is like when screen quota is really, really tightened, okay? So here you can see um, from 1980s tightened, the whole movie uh, market is kind of, you know, collapsing. You, know, you can see the number of seats for foreign, uh, foreign films, notably Hollywood, and also Korean films. You know, the number of seats for you know, older films is kind of you know, collapsing. Another interesting point is like when screen quota is not really tightened, then you can see there is a huge increase, okay? Here and here at the end. Uh, screen quota is very interesting because um, this is one of the hot issue when Korea began to uh, negotiate the US Korea free trade agreement. So this is a, one of the preconditions that the United States put out you know, to Korean government. They said, if you want to have FTA negotiation that you have to abolish screen quota. Of course, at the time, you know, a lot of movie, you know, uh, the people in movie, the uh, movie industry, they believe that screen quota is really, really important. And then they said, we should keep the screen quota. Otherwise the Korean film industry will will collapse and then this is not good at all, okay? Um, so this is the thing, but in the end, you know, they did not abolish the screen quota, but instead of abolishing the screen quota, they just cut the screen quota half. So before it was like 146 days, that is only to show Korean films at movie theater. But after screen quota cut, so in half, it is like the, you know, 73 days, that is for Korean films at movie theater. Okay, so for that one, people said, you know, this is not good and it's will really kill the Korean film industry. Um, now, because, um, you know, in the middle, you can see the date, okay, for the screen quota cut. And then I compare the number of, you know, films and then the number of admission. Okay, first, you can see the, you know, black line here in terms of, you know, number of Korean films, you know, there's no change even before and after screen quota cut. When it comes to number of foreign films, of course, there's no change. 
the only change happen uh, when it comes to the number of admission. You can see that after screen quarter there is a slight increase for foreign films. And then there is in, uh, some kind of you know, uh, huge decline for Korean films. For that one, a lot of people, they argue, you see, this is the proof that screen quota is really, really working. This is effective and that we need to have you know, screen quota again. Okay. However, the interesting thing is like, you know, several you know, years, you know, you can see there is a, some kind of collapse, but after 2009, there's another, you know, booming, you know, uh, for Korean films. So that means basically even there is a screen quota cut and then maybe this is not the direct, you know, issue for this, you know, um, decrease in number of, you know, admission. Let me just, you know, talk about something interesting. Um, the screen quota cut, you know, the screen quota, they said, you know, they are guaranteeing the number of days for Korean films, okay, at movie theater, okay? Again, this is the number of days. However, movie theater, they are really, really smart, you know, and then they want to make more money. So what they did is actually they are manipul manipulating with the number of sessions. For example, they already know that Korean films are not really, really popular, so they show Korean film once a day. Instead, when it comes to foreign films, you know, Korean movie theater, they show, you know, like five times or six times from you know, 8 a.m. till midnight, you know, to they show, you know, foreign films to make a lot of money. So this kind of things happen, okay? Of course, screen quota card, you know, has been changed. So, you know, before it was 146 days, but now it is 73 days. So that means basically for movie theater, they have to utilize Korean films. And then more recently, Korean films are really, really competitive. This is good. So they show, you know, Korean films more and more. And then they, if there is any good Korean films, and then they just, you know, keep showing that in order to fill up the 73 day, you know, the screen quota, you know, cut. So this is one thing. In the market, you know, the number of foreign films, I mean, you know, the number of foreign films to show this is kind of under control. But again, you know, the number of admission, you know, the government cannot control anything. Of course, you know, the movie theater, they try to make a lot of money and then they try to show really, really, really successful Korean films, like a commercial, you know, lized Korean films. So in Korean movie, uh, movie theaters, the screen quota cut actually pushed uh, Korean movie industry to be more commercialized for both. Korean films and the foreign films. Another interesting issue like, is multiplex, okay? Since 1994, in the Korean industry, film industry, they build up a lot of multiplex. That means they have a lot of, you know, uh, screens. Now for that one, you know, they have to have a lot of, you know, films from this country and that country, okay? Actually, it's not screen quota that increased the, you know, in terms of the diversity, but it is more like a screen quota cut that actually helped the diversity of Korean films in Korea. Another thing is like blockbuster. This is very important actually, you know, this is a link to the, uh, the import quota uh, abolishment. At the time, you know, the Korean devils, they cannot produce, uh, they invested in Hollywood and they tried to bring back that films back to Korea, but they failed. However, while they are working with Hollywood uh, studios, they learn, you know, planned programming budget system, which means basically before it is like in you know, a Korean director and then he have his you know, own scenario and story and then he had to find some kind of budget and financing and then he has some, you know, some idea for actors and actresses. However, you know, in Jables, you know, they, they changed the whole game and they just became just like, you know, Hollywood studios. They said, okay, now we have really, really good scenario from someone really well known. Then we have really, really talented, you know, director. And then we hire really good actor and actresses. Okay. And then behind there is Jables who is giving a lot of money to produce films. So actually because of the money is coming back to Korean film industry, and then the Jable does this kind of, you know, planning, programming, budgeting system, and then it helps um, to enhance the quality of Korean films. Now, the last one is subsidies. And this is also very interesting. Always Korea, I mean, it's not just about Korea, but other in the countries, they always believe that the French system is really, really good. And then 
when they just want, when over French films, you know, policies, actually it is mostly about the subsidies. So Korean government, they believe that they need to give subsidies. Of course, when, you know, in 1960s, Korea is kind of poor and then the government does not have a lot of, you know, uh, money, so they did not do a lot of things, okay? However, after, especially after the screen quota quote happened in 2006, Korean government began to give subsidies, all right? Uh, some people argue that because of Korean government giving subsidies to film industries, and that this is the key factor that enhanced the Korean film industry, and this is why, you know, like, you know, films Old Boy or Parasite, you know, has been really popular across the world. However, if you went over carefully about the subsidies, the beneficiary of subsidies, it's not really a big company, but it's like a small and medium-sized company that is existing not in Seoul area, but you know, outside of Seoul. So there is basically, if you know the Parasite and Old Boy, they are owned financed by big jable, big companies. So actually Korean you know, subsidies, you know, it does not go to these big companies, okay? Um, this is, you know, to promote, you know, Korean films, of course, they are, they argue, okay, but one interesting point is like, you know, if you compare the, the, the level of subsidies between Korea and France, this is very interesting. If you meet some Korean people in the Korean film, film industry and you ask about the subsidy, then they say, hey, you know, we receive a lot of subsidies when compared with, you know, uh, before, that's what they argue. So they believe that the subsidy is helping the Korean uh, film industry. But the interesting thing is like, if you compare the level of subsidy with France, you can see, you know, here, the level of Korean, uh, subsidies in Korea is much lower than France. Another interesting part is, although Korean government does not give much subsidy, but Korea produce more films than France, according to UNESCO data sets. Well, uh, Petro already mentioned, you know, we, we already argue, you know, okay, Korean government did not give a lot of subsidies, but Korea produced a lot of films. Then a lot of French people, they said, oh, okay, maybe France does not produce a lot of films, but in terms of quality, they said, French film is much better. That's what they said. This is why, you know, Patrick and I, we went over all, you know, the data sets in order to figure out, you know, how the quality is, you know, as Petro already mentioned, not just, you know, audience, but also the critics, they both said Korean film, the Korean film's quality is better than France, French films. So still in a subsidy, without much subsidy, you can see that there is a way to enhance the quality and also the number of films, okay? All right, let me conclude you know, my presentation. Um, here, what I want to argue is it's not the protectionist measure that protect or that enhance the competitiveness of the film industry, but it is more like a pro-competitive measures that helps the Korean film industry. So, you know, by you know, abolishing or decreasing some kind of a protectionist policies, you know, by Korean government actually it makes the competitiveness, competitive environment for the film industry and it helps to produce better films in Korea. Another thing is like a commercial success can promote, you know, cultural power. As you said, some people, they said, you know, the commercial films, this is not good for culture. But in fact, if you understand, you know, the impact of Parasite or several films, actually, although they are really commercial, but actually they can, you know, promote the culture power of Korea, okay? So per competition provision, and then the market-oriented policies, some people, they are, just, they are completely against, you know, because they said this is against culture. But actually what I argue is this is not really against culture. Okay, when it comes to you know the cultural diversity, this is one of the hot topic you know we talk a lot in, in Europe. So for the cultural diversity, the Europeans they decided block in or they decided to have some kind of Netflix quota. But you have to think about you know what cultural diversity really is. You know, just to protecting you know some films or dramas from other countries is helping the you know cultural diversity or just like Korean case, we open up the market and then actually it helps the cultural diversity. So you really, really need to think about the cultural diversity. Okay, so this is my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jimmy. And thank you very much, Patrick, for your presentations. I was about to ask uh, questions, uh, but then I realized that a lot of our participants have already uh, put, uh, you know, asked questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and start reading off 
some of the questions from our audience. And for those who have not asked yet, uh, please put in your question in the Q&A box and we will try if time allows uh, to go through each and one of them. The first question that I think is relevant to both of your talks as you uh, talked about subsidies is from Yong Park. Thanks for your presentation, Dr. Mesolang. Can you can the success of the Korean film industry be mainly attributed to low subsidies and fewer regulations? Have you considered other factors? There are a lot of examples of other countries which offer little subsidies and impose fewer regulations, but have much weaker film industries. I think both uh, Jimin and Patrick could answer this question. And then um, the first slide, in the first slide of my own presentation, I insist on the fact that this um, uh, low subsidies, or at least subsidies which are really seriously managed by the state and uh, the uh, good regulations, uh, they are a contribution to the success. Of course, the success of the film industry is essentially driven by the, the producers, the film producers, the actors, that mean the people who are really making the films. Uh, and uh, you may have a possibility that uh, these people are not there. They, they just have left the country. This is the example of Mexico. Uh, Mexico has liberalized, but badly liberalized the film industry. And then all the big guys uh, in terms of Mexican producers, they just uh, went to Los Angeles and to California. So if you have to have these skills in your own country, and the, uh, that was been the capacity of the table to organize the industry and to keep the Korean skills in terms of filmmaking, actors, etc., to keep them at home, and then to create this environment, which is relatively uni unique. So I, I agree. The film policy is a background. It's not the, uh, the, the driving force, if you, if you will, I can say. Jimmy? OK, thank you uh, for your question. This is very interesting, actually. OK, you, it is correct, you know, what you said. Like, for example, there are some countries, he said, you know, less country, I, I mean, less you know, subsidies, and then, you know, like a decrease in policies, and then absolutely it have. I mean, sometimes it brings some kind of disaster. One good example, actually, Petro mentioned, uh, this is Mexico. So Mexico, they try to open its market, and then, you know, um, then it collapsed. Okay, um, actually in 2000, early 2000s, you know, when Korea, Korean government had negotiation, I mean, FTA negotiation with, you know, US government at the time, the Korean uh, news media was they highlighting that, oh, Korean government is tried to abolish screen quota, you know, this is not good. And then this will kill the Korean film industry. And then they try to highlight what happened in Mexico. Okay, but one thing you have to know really carefully, um, first, you know, one of the key factor in Mexico uh, already, you know, Mexico did not have, you know, um, like a, in a kind of weak in the film industry before they open up the market. Another thing is like, a, you know, they don't have really, 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 you know, like a um, talented or a strong company like Jebel that we have in Korea. And this is huge differences, okay? So basically, you know, it's not the government money, but the big jabbers, they are using their own money in order to make some, you know, generate some profits. And then they try to produce quality films. They can be in competition with Hollywood films in domestic market. So this is a key factor. And then without, you know, having, you know, big, I mean, good company that does a lot of things in one country, but this is like kind of disaster. Another thing, one uh, important, you know, if you think about the what happened in France, actually there is a big company like within the um, you know company, but the thing is like they are trying to have some kind of you know uh, invested interest between government and the company, and then you know the gov company and the government they are tightly related, and then when they you know uh, amend some regulations and policies, actually this is not for the film industry, but this is for a company. So this is um you know kind of tricky issue you have to think about twice, thank you. 
All right, thank you. And the next question comes from Michael Osborne. As I watched Korean movies for the past two decades, I noticed a downward trend in the quality of the films in terms of story, writing, and paradigms. Can you comment on the Korean film industry trend to emulate the US film industry, which assumes a dumb audience, and how that has adversely affected their quality? You mean you are better yep. dressed? <laughs> it's a okay. Korean view and Korean films. Okay, very good question. Okay, um, well, there is some issue. So you know, as Patrick said, you know, in our book, we try to get some kind of data sets from certain you know countries like UK, France, United States, Korea, you know. So, and then we compare the quality from critics' perspective. So they are the film specialist and from audience view, okay? So it's more like, you know, IMDB or Rotten Tomatoes, we just calculate. So basically we uh, accumulate almost, you know, data sets for almost like 4,000 something, you know, films. And then we, you know, evaluate the quality. In fact, in terms of quality from the audience, you know, Korean films are better than, you know, any other countries, slight better. When it comes to you know uh, critics evaluation, they also said Korean films are better. So this is the interesting part. Now, uh, Michael Michael's question. This is very interesting and a very good question actually. The thing is actually when we analyze data sets, we also realize that there's some kind of you know down downward trend in terms of you know uh, films, okay, Korean films, okay. Although this one is still better than you know some other countries. Um, the thing is like, you know, this is related to government policy again, okay? Um, the Korean government actually try to project sometimes their ideology, you know, something like that. And which is far from the, you know, consumers or audience expectation, okay? Recently, especially recently, you know, um, there's a lot of films, you know, that produce and then the, basically the outline is for, I mean, this is about uh, the the occupation period, you know, of Japan and Korea, or they try to highlight, you know, some, you know, left or right side something, and then, you know, there is a lot of ideology things going on in the film industry, and then actually this is hindering, you know, um, uh, the, uh, the 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 quality of films. Of course, this one does not happen just you know during the Moon Jae In administration, but this also happened, you know, during Park Geun uh, administration. So whenever there is a government, they uh, try to give some kind of, you know, impact, you know, then this is, you know, kind of hindering the quality of, uh, the hindering uh, the, qual the quality of films. Okay, I hope this is enough. Patrick? Well, the, again, uh, as Jimmy mentioned, this is, um, you, we have two levels of comparison a level of comparison for one period. So the, as we Jim said, we have the ratings of the Korean films are better. It's, we did not do the figures. We, you just, we just calculate the average. So we, we did the change the ratings, of course. So the, on average, the ratings of the Korean film are better than the, um, uh, the average of our decade, the average of the French or British or US film. Now, year by year, that's open to question. Uh, you may wonder whether it's not the kind of general push of all the film industry in the world to produce, produce, produce. And we know a little bit that in fact, mass production in the cultural domain is not necessarily uh, the key, uh, a key element of success in the long run. So we have, only a decade. I'm sorry, we cannot go fur further, but for the decade, the results is there that in the Korean film industry on average are better uh, according to the experts and according to the movie, average movie of course, better than the uh, uh, for the three other countries. Uh, yeah, so if I could just uh, piggyback on that question and perhaps even the second question that Yong -ha asked, uh, Jimmy and I heard you talk about the quality of Korean films. Uh, how do you measure the quality of a film? What is the measurement of that? You spoke, you said on numerous occasions 
that the film critics are the ones who also judge the quality of the films. Um, but this is very subjective, right? Uh, even the film critics is very subjective. Relying on IMDb or Rotten Tomatoes is very risky and dangerous in and of itself. So how and who decides the quality of the film? Good question. Okay, thank you. Um, this is why actually Patrick did not utilize the word quality, but instead of quality, he's trying to say, you know, he's trying to, to use like attractiveness, okay? Of course, there is any good way to measure quality, then we are welcome, you know, we are always welcome to use that one, okay? However, this is, as you said, this is very subjective and this is very difficult, okay? And then this is why you know we try to find some other you know uh, praxis that we can utilize easily in order to figure out the quality or in order to measure quality. Some people they argue maybe you have to use the number of you know prizes received at the international film festival. Um, there's a lot of articles about film festival, but this is kind of interesting because if you see the trend, this is always related to locality. That means if the film festival happen in Europe, then usually. This is like European films or non-US films that receive the prizes, okay? If the film festival happen in America, then usually this is American films that receive the, you know, so there is some kind of locality issues. So we are not using that. And also sometimes it is driven by the ideology or the politics, you know, there is a lot of articles about that. One. Right. Um, so we try to have some kind of, you know, not, completely objective, but at least persist, persuasive in you know, the data sets. This is why we pick up the data sets from IMDB and the Rotten Tomato and Metacritics, okay? Of course, again, if there is a better way to measure the quality or attractiveness of problem, of course, we, we are welcome, you know, if you just tell me and then we're gonna use that one. So, but without that one, you know, still the people who argue that French films are much better in terms of quality. And then when I ask them, hey, do you have any, you know, data sets and they only said like, oh French film received more film uh, more prizes at movie uh, the international film festival then I said like hey what do you think about the Hollywood films do you think the quality is good or not it's, it's, usually French people they said absolutely not then I said hey look just go to website and then count the, the number of Hollywood films received the number of prizes that Hollywood film received Okay, I did actually. You, American films received more number of prizes at you know film festivals than you know French films, but still a lot of people they believe that the quality of French film is much better. Okay, again, there is a lot of issues, so you need to th think about it. So again, I said if there is anyone who can offer us better data set, you know we are open and then we can work together, you know to have to measure the quality more properly. Thank you. We could talk about this topic all day, uh, and I don't want to monopolize it. Um, film measuring the quality of a film based on the amount of awards it received at film festivals—that's that—that is a very problematic, right? Um, because we know that the Oscars is very incestuous, and they only promote their own uh, Hollywood films. And *Parasite* might have been. Uh, an outlier here. Okay, so let's go back to the audience. Uh, this one comes from Jasmine. In terms of the abolition of the import quotas from 1958 to 86, after that was done, do you think that played a major role in the tremendous success of the Korean film industry we know of today? Well, Jimin, you want to start or do I start? Oh, you can go for us. I gave a you know answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, first we should start the converse. Who was benefiting from the import quota? And in fact, when you look at the economics of the import quota, the people who benefit from the import quota was the guys who have the possibility to import the films. So it was the importers or the distributors. It was not the producers of the film. So if you are interested in the film production of your own country, uh, it's a very bad system because in fact, you reward people who are importing the foreign films and not uh, 
helping to produce the domestic the domestic films. And the the situation of the Korean producer film producer has been worse and worse during the import quota period. Well, when the import quota was removed, then it was a kind of catastrophic situation in the Korean film industry. All the guys who were really rich, if I may, may use this term, the importers and distributors disappeared or were making bad, bad money. And uh, the film producers were still without uh, a capacity to go to the movie maker, to the movie theaters. So you need a decade of some people, a completely new set of film companies, which have nothing to do with the old generation, uh, the generation of the uh, 85, of the 80s, the new guys who are trying to start from scratch. And this is the sub subsidiary of the tables. They just say, okay, maybe we should do, we should work on modern film and do a film by looking at what the Americans have done. But then let me add one thing that Jimmy and me have said already, but we did not push too much on this. Uh, a great distinction between Mexico and Korea is that Mexico liberalized the distribution of the films, but they were not able to really make something from the production level, the, the production segment of the films, because for various reasons which are typically Mexican uh, fights between faction and level. So of course what happened in Mexico is that the, uh, the movie theaters were bought by either Mexicans with a nice uh, link with the US or were bought by the US and all these guys wanted to have a very quick return on their investment and the best way to have a very quick return on investment was in fact to distribute US films. On the contrary, what happened in Korea is that the movie makers, oh, sorry, the table, were interested in doing production, not distribution, in doing production. And so they built a system in which it is a vertical integrated company with production, distribution, exhibition. And you have only these three companies in distribution, which is under high attack <laughs> in, in Korea traditionally, because you say, ah, oh, this is a monopoly or quasi-monopoly, et cetera, et cetera. But this has been a very important cons industrial construction to help the production of the Korean film industry by the Koreans, and to make sure that the system was working until the end. And we have worked a long time, Jimin and me, on this data on the distribution system, which shows really that you have been able to distribute more domestic films, blockbusters than we in France. So the, and this, is the, this is not our views, this is the views of the French movie goers. This is the view of the Korean movie goers. We are just taking the view of the, of the people. So this is the, the specificity of the Korean industry, this vertical integration. And in fact, in the US, they did not have that. In the movie theaters, they were cut, the movie theaters were cut from the distribution, from the production side by an anti competition uh, system called the Paramount case. And it's only last year that, in fact, the US have now reunited the possibility of production, distribu distribution, exhibition, which is probably a key element of the monitoring of the quality from all the system. Jimmy? Oh, okay. Well, well, the thing is, like, you know, um, it's not just about the abolish, abolishment of, you know, the import quota, but again, you know, as Patrick said, this is the, um, the Jebel, you know, they are behind, you know. So without Jebel, you know, it's kind of difficult. But another interesting thing is, like, you have to understand the internationalization. You know, when it comes to culture, they always believe that it is better to just block, you know, the other, you know, uh, countries, culture, products, whatever. But when it comes to con uh, Korea, this is very interesting because, you know, uh, as I told before, you know, for Korean companies, actually the name is CJ, okay? So the Jil Jedang, and then they began to invest in Hollywood, okay? Not it's not just about defending the country or their own territory, but it's more like, you know, they try to do something more 
So this is why Patrick mentioned, you know, Mick Kelly several times, you know, who is the um the vice president of you know CJ Kyogeda. So at the time, you know, they went to United States, they invested there, and then they learn a lot of things and then they bring back to Korea. So this process is very, very important. And then why well, I believe that this is due to the globalization of you know Korean film industry. Okay. Thank you. All right, the next question comes from Jenny Wong Medina. Can you speak to labor issues in the film industry? As film became part of the cultural industries and content industries, did the conception of cultural labor change? And has the success of Korean film internationally led to a rethinking of the material conditions of labor in the film industry? Uh, sorry, I did not hear well. Label A A B E N. Labor. Labor, yes. L A B O R. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I was not sure. Labor. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, I was like several years ago, uh, Patrick and I we went to a conference and there is um Korean director and then who is complaining about the labor issue in Korean film industry. Okay. And then they said this is really bad, whatever. Um what Patrick did in France is actually we are meeting also some people, you know, the, the, the people who is working for French film industry, you know. The interesting thing is like they are also complaining a lot about the labor issue in France. He said, this is not good. And then we receive only a few money. And then, you know, they are just complaining about, you know, the thing, all right? So I don't know, you know, if labor issue, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is not, I mean, this is better or something, but you also need to think about, you know, the comparison between country and country, you know? So this is another thing that you need to figure out. So if I may just, in France, we have a system which is publicly funded uh, for um, uh, subsidizing part-time working in the film industry. So it's a system which you, which you use something like one million of people, or I, I'm sure I'm not sure about the figure. I think I exaggerated the figure, but a huge number of people who have only a few hours or a few weeks to work here and there, and then that's it. So the labor, the labor, uh, the, the labor in the film industry, French film industry, is not ideal either. That's you have to be really conscious about that. It's not because the state is there. Okay, um, I'm gonna combine three questions together because I feel these three questions have uh, a common thread. Uh, the first one is from TS10, I believe. Thanks for a great presentation. Much of your discussion has focused on the domestic market in South Korea, but how have Korean films performed in foreign markets? Parasite was a critical success, but have Korean films found commercial success abroad? And following that is from Ava. How do you think the Hallyu phenomena affects the Korean film industry? Followed by Junan's question, which asks about Netflix's role in propagating Korean film. He asks, should we regard movies produced by American company regarded as Korean original film or should it be regarded as foreign film? And uh, along the question of Netflix, he said he mentions Netflix has become a very famous media platform and it distributes original contents. Through the American company's investment, Korean actors in Korea and the movie they take is distributed through various language subtitles. Three questions rather similar in tone and uh, idea. So yes. Well, uh, again, com comparing France and Korea is very telling. Uh, Netflix arrive in Korea, invest in Korea and make success in Korea and they try to expand the success. In fact, they try to, to put a film, a Korean film how do you say in Korean, Honja? Do you mean the Korean film made by Netflix to the uh, Festival de Cannes two years ago? Okta. Okta, yes. Okay. Sorry for the. So 
in fact, Netflix, without any help of the Korean government, tried to use what they thought would be the uh, uh, comparative advantage of the Korean film industry, and uh, they, they tried to export it. As I said in the beginning, very few industries export large amounts of films. In American, uh, the US is the only example of you know, this kind of export-driven uh, film industry. In France, of course, Netflix did not invest in this way, but now we tax Netflix in order to uh, in, require from Netflix to create French films. So as a French, I'm wondering how Netflix, because his tax will do good French film or better French film, then Netflix, when he's not taxed in Korea, will do Korean films. You have to, to realize that there is a very twisted uh, aspect here, where in fact we try to mimic what happened in Korea by taxing. And I'm, in some sense, we put Netflix in charge of the film, the French film industry. Uh, for me, I found that a little bit uh, bizarre, let's say. Okay, um, let me put out the first question okay, about the parasite. Um, this is interesting. Uh, the thing is like, you know, okay, Korea can produce good films, but then the distribution and exhibition in other countries, there is a different story, okay? Because they are private entities and then they do whatever they like in order to generate profits. For example, in France, usually the concept or the idea about Korean films, you know, if you ask French people, hey, what do you think about Korean films? And they usually say it's bloody, they just killing people. And this is a you know, really, you know, Say the story, that's what they said. But the thing is like, actually, this is not the issue of Korean film producers, but this is the distributor and exhibitor in France because they only import that kind of films, okay? So this is one issue. Another thing, when Patrick and I, we analyze what happened in Australia, the thing is, again, the Australia, Australian movie theater, they are not interested in exhibiting Asian films, although they know that they are popular. So in, the number of you know, Asian films imported in Australia has increased significantly, but it's not movie theater that show Asian films, but it is more like you know, the uh, streaming platforms. So you can see you know, the thing. Another thing, very interesting, uh, when it comes to Parasite and France, um, the distributor of Parasite, actually they encountered bankruptcy almost. <laughs> and then thanks to distributing Parasite, they became one of top distributor in France. So this is, you know, the power of, you know, Korean film industry outside of Korea. So this is one other thing. Um, second, when it comes to Netflix and foreign films and Korean films, this is a very interesting question. As, as Patrick said, Okja, officially this is not Korean film, this is American film, okay? So Korea, the film industry, they received some money from Netflix. Current actors and directors, they benefited from Netflix investment. And then Okja is promoting Korea. So again, the money is from, from Netflix. So this is good for Korea or not? Okay. Another one, um, the, another interesting thing is like, you know, several years ago, the Warner Bros, they invest a lot of money in France and then they produced a film. It's uh, like, you know, well, long demotion fiance. I don't know the title in uh, in English language, but this is like one hundred percent French story and French language, but funded by America, uh, Warner Bros. And then the French government did not recognize it as French films because of the funding is coming from you know um, France. So, and then also the Minari, and a lot of people they argue this is Korean film, but officially this is not. This is American films. But then American films promoting Korea and this is good for Korea or not? You have to think about it. So the nationality of film is really important or you know, maybe you have to have the other way around. You know? This is always I argue with Europeans you know, when it comes to Netflix. I mean, when it comes to Netflix, they said like, Netflix is not good. It's, it is just distributing the American culture. I said, hey, excuse me. End game uh, of industries, you, know, you can see tour. And then basically the figure is from the Nordic country. So basically this is a European story. 
I said, hey, look at the Cinderella and the Beauty and Beast, you know, produced by Disney, whatever. And then this is a European story. However, Netflix or Americans, they are promoting, you know, European culture. So this is good or not. And then, you know, national audio film is important or not. You have to think about us twice, it's third time, three times. Uh, the third question, Hallyu and Korean film, um, the impact, yes, there is um, title related because, you know, because K-pop and then the emergence of Korean drama, a lot of people, they are interested in watching Korean films. And then a lot of them, they are available online, regardless, you know, the, I mean, the subscription or not. So actually this is highly related because of K-pop, people, they are interested in, you know, watching Korean series or Korean films or even Korean, you know, like a food or something. So they are always related somehow. Okay, so we only have a minute left. Um, and I wanna take this time to read off two of our uh, audience members. Um, th these are not questions, these are more uh, comments. But I thought these two comments were very interesting. Uh, the first one is from Carolyn Hines. This, really, this isn't really a question, but as a film critic, when we use the term quality, we're usually referring to production quality, as in the quality of the sets, costume design, and props. High level means how well made they're done. Quality also applies to sound design, cinematography, storytelling, and acting, and so forth. So that's really interesting for both of you to think about when you uh, quantify uh, and try to measure uh, the idea of quality of films. Mm -hmm. um, and the second comment, mm -hmm. which I found to be also equally interesting, is from T.S. Tan again. I'm not going to read the entire uh, comment, but I believe uh, what the comment is saying is, have you both, uh, have the two of you considered the demographics of the audience and uh, viewers. So, you know, just because Rotten Tomatoes or IMDb uh, has a certain number, um, does that reflect the general population or is it really gendered? Is it, uh, so the demographics, the breakdown, the age and so forth. I think that is a very important uh, question to uh, look at as you continue your research and your study in, uh, the quantification of uh, films and the film industry. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for all the questions. There are so many more questions that I couldn't get to. Uh, and I'm really terribly sorry about that. Uh, but again, we only had uh, just a little bit of time. So uh, thank you once again to the audience for asking these wonderful questions. And thank you to the both of you uh, for giving your lecture. Thank you for having me. We'll end it here. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Bye -bye. so much.